Dr. Rasmussen, uh, just thank you so much for joining us uh, here today for uh, another uh, developing discussion that we're having hooked on uh, coronavirus vaccine candidates. Uh, there's been so much news in the past week and uh, sharing your expertise with our audience uh, today and uh, sort of trying to prognosticate a little bit on what this means for us going forward is hugely beneficial. So first and foremost, before we get into the discussion of vaccines, I wanted to thank you for coming on and ask how you're doing. I'm doing well. I'm really busy, but I'm really glad to be here, and thanks for having me. I'm sure you're busy. It's been um, a hectic week on the healthcare media front, uh, and I'm sure doubly so for you and your colleagues right now as um, you know, we're now dealing with some greater and greater developments on the front of, of vaccines. And uh, alluding to, of course, last week we got some early results uh, for mRNA uh, 1273 that looked very promising across 40, 45 healthy participants, right? Immune responses shortly into the phase one assessment, enough to warrant a phase three assessment, according to the investigators, just based off of that. And then, of course, the even greater news on Monday coming from the thousand plus patient trial from the University of Oxford for their vaccine candidate. Um, as we were just talking offline, a little bit of a different reception from that, but probably greater in magnitude and amplification. So um, why don't we just start chronologically and discuss mRNA-1273 to start. Can you tell us a little bit about how you receive these findings and what they mean for you right now? So, I mean, I actually received both of the findings in a similar way. Um, I, I thought that, you know, they are, they're promising um, preliminary results. So neither study showed any kind of efficacy data. So we don't know how effective either vaccine is at either preventing infection or um, mitigating disease severity. Um, you know, certainly for the Moderna one, it was great to actually see that data in the context of an actual paper as opposed to a press release, which um, prior data about these vaccines have often come out as news stories before they've come out as data that you could actually look at and examine. So I was very happy to see that come out um, in a full paper and a report um, in which we could actually go through the data and, and look and see what, what they found. Um, certainly, you know, it's a much more limited trial than the, the one that was done for the Oxford vaccine just because there were fewer patients and that really is kind of what distinguishes the true phase one trial that Moderna conducted as opposed to the sort of combo phase one, two trial that the Oxford group conducted. Um, but in both cases, I mean, it does look like these antibody or these vaccines are immunogenic. They can uh, at least elicit antibody responses. The Oxford vaccine um, is shown to elicit T cell responses as well. Um, all, both of those things are very encouraging and suggest that the vaccine works. I was a little bit concerned with um, the safety data for the Moderna vaccine, just because three patients had to be withdrawn for what they called systemic adverse reactions. It was unclear to me by reading that paper how severe those were. I know that one patient uh, spoke to the media early on about um, fainting in his home and having an extremely high fever uh, and um, uncontrollable nausea and vomiting which is a pretty severe adverse event for a vaccine. And this is kind of the trouble with phase one trials. So the vaccine is generally has an acceptable safety profile, but there's so few patients that it's really hard to say if that severe event was something very rare or if it was something that we'll see a lot more of as they scale up to a phase three trial with thousands of participants. So I was a little bit concerned about that, but in general, um, it's great to see that both vaccines are meeting these acceptable uh, safety profiles at least enough to move on to a phase three trial where they can actually look at efficacy for both. Yeah, yeah, and just to echo the point that you made, of course, of it coming uh, through a medical journal release uh, rather than breaking away from the trend of these uh, news release and teasers, which um, you know was kind of plaguing the entire discussion even a month plus ago. I'm glad to see it get back to a more traditional standard of how we're digesting uh, clinical developments and understanding. So that's great. And thank you for saying that. And um, just curious because, you know, the reception that at least uh, I saw immediately on social media of all places uh, pertaining to the Oxford vaccine candidate uh, hooked a lot of concern, of course, around the adverse events that were observed there, uh, more so in the rate of 
uh, participants. I think it was close to 70% out of the 1,000 that they assessed. But um, it, it seemed also to be a little bit lost in that discussion that, you know, a great emphasis of this is dose finding. And the investigators even said up front that they were emphasizing greater doses to try to elicit immune response, assure that, you know, this is something that they should proceed with. Is, is that something that we need to, I guess, hold as, you know, a, a limitation whenever we're discussing, of course, very early vaccine assessments, or is that just, you know, the nature of how we go about it? I mean, it is partly the nature of how we go about it. It also, while the adverse event um, rate was much higher for the Oxford vaccine, from what I could tell, um, the the severity of those events was lower than um, the, the patients that were withdrawn from the Moderna trial. And, uh, you know, we do expect there to be some adverse events sometimes with the vaccine. So muscle pain, um, maybe a, a little fever. And you know, the, the thing to remember about the Oxford vaccine as well is it is a live virus. It's a virus vector vaccine. Um, it's a chimpanzee adenovirus, which is uh, probably unlikely to have infected most people, which is why they use that as opposed to a human adenovirus. Um, but anytime you're injecting a live virus into somebody and it's replicating, you, you may have those responses, um, fever, uh, muscle pain, um, you know, some malaise or fatigue, uh, all, of, all of these things are, are common um, when you have any kind of viral infection. So it's not terribly surprising. What is good is that um, it doesn't seem like those adverse events lasted for a long time. Nobody got a severe chimpanzee adenovirus infection uh, from that. And it actually may suggest that that vaccine is going to be more effective or may induce longer term immunity just because those responses are actually the immune system at work controlling that viral infection. So um, it's really hard to say uh, how, again, this is going to scale up, if this is going to result in um, adverse effects that are really intolerable at the phase three stage for a large proportion of patients, that would be a, a huge issue and may cause a, a vaccine trial to actually fail. Um, and it's not that not to dismiss the importance of these types of adverse events, but it, it kind of depends on what you're trying to protect against, right? Like, so if you want to prevent protect the population from getting SARS coronavirus two, perhaps a mild um, transient chimpanzee adenovirus infection is something that we're willing to live with. Um, a similar thing happened uh, during the development of the vaccine that's now used for Ebola virus that was uh, trialed beginning in West Africa. That vaccine had not gone to the clinic prior to the West African epidemic because it's a viral vectored vaccine and a virus called vesicular stomatitis virus that causes a rash and, and some mild flu-like illness in one to two percent of people who get it. Um, when it came down to it, initially they, they said, well, Ebola is so rare. Um, it's not worth the adverse effects that would happen if we started vaccinating a lot of people with this. But then you have 28,000 people infected with Ebola virus, and suddenly vesicular stomatitis virus adverse events in 1% to 2% of people who receive the vaccine don't seem like such a big deal in comparison to getting Ebola virus disease. So um, it's really a matter of perspective. I think that, you know, if it's Again, if it's very rare that you would have a systemic, very serious adverse event from the Oxford vaccine, uh, I think that's probably an acceptable trade-off to have these mild adverse events in 70% of people. As you pointed out, some of it is dose finding. And the same was true for the Moderna vaccine. Almost all of the people who had these systemic adverse events had it either after the second um, dose, the, the booster shot, or they had it um, in the highest dosing group. And, uh, and that's one, one thing that's also really important to do in these clinical trials is to really find that sweet spot where you're going to minimize those types of adverse events, but you're also going to get um, acceptable immune responses to the vaccine.